Good morning. I'm Dr. Glenn Ross from the Division of Sports Medicine and Shoulder Surgery at the New England Baptist Hospital in Boston, Massachusetts. This morning I'd like to say, share some thoughts with you on shoulder arthritis in young patients and the challenges and choices we face. My disclosures are that uh, listed from Arthrex and Tournier for research and institutional support. Some resources that are available online, uh, ViewMedi and the Rush Journal of Orthopedics both have excellent articles uh, concerning this topic and some of the acknowledgments I'd like to give to my colleagues who've assisted me in pursuing this area. The issues concerning shoulder arthritis in young people are complex. This is a rapidly increasing area on an epidemiologic basis, and we feel the, epi the etiology is multifactorial. Trauma, excessive use, post-surgical problems all exist, as well as early osteoarthritis, rheumatoid arthritis, shoulder instability, implant failure, avascular necrosis, and chondrolysis from the past decade. The younger patient presenting with significant arthritis and articular deterioration is no longer a rare event. There are many treatment options available, however, they have a varying degree of success. I find the literature to be confusing at best with proponents for various options often regionally successful. So let's briefly look at the etiology of glenohumeral articular cartilage disease, or shoulder arthritis. At times, this can be an inflammatory arthrosis, and at times, this can come secondary to instability issues with traumatic bone lesions. Trauma has been known to be implicated in the development of post-traumatic arthritis, as well as repetitive wear and use. Chondrolysis, perhaps from the use of pain pumps, avascular necrosis, have all been implicated for the usual factors. There have also been post-surgical and implant issues, especially with some of the earlier generations of implants. Kobayashi in 2014 looked at the risk factors for osteoarthritis in Japan and found that age and hypertension were two of the predominant risk factors. Hovelius looked at shoulder arthritis 25 years after a dislocation cohort and showed that 56% of patients showed at least radiographic signs of arthritis after an index dislocation. What are the pathomechanics of osteoarthritis? Well, these consist of anterior soft tissue contractures, and this leads to deficiencies in external rotation and internal rotation contractures. This leads to also increased joint forces, as well as flattening of the humeral head and osteophyte or bone spur formation, all of which can be seen in the top radiograph. This can cause and eventually lead to posterior subluxation of the humerus on the glenoid. Again, this will lead to posterior capsular laxity, perhaps a biconcave glenoid. So who are the patients presenting with shoulder arthritis? Well, more and more these younger patients, both chronologically and biologically, present a moving target for us. Many of the patients are weightlifters, former football players, predominantly male, those engaged in heavy lifting and construction often present with arthritis quite typically earlier than the average osteoarthritic. Post-fracture and post-dislocation issues have already been alluded to. Post-stabilization problems present as well. Several years ago, non-anatomic repairs, such as the Magnuson stack, the putty plat, and the Bristow, were known to have high degrees of association of arthritis with the uh, technique performed. These patients, however, often are very active, they have high expectations and a long life expectancy. For instance, this patient, 51 years old, Jamaican Olympic powerlifting champion, former professional football player who's undergone two arthroscopies at age 45 and presents still with severe degenerative joint disease. Or this 44-year-old construction worker who had a Bristow procedure 25 years ago, who now presents with end-stage arthritis requiring daily use of narcotics. Many of these patients are power lifters, and we've studied this group in detail. This group has a very high incidence of shoulder arthritis, perhaps on a repetitive or overuse basis, as well as on a traumatic incidence. Shoulder arthroplasty after dislocation has also been noted. 
Dr. Walsh and Edwards published the results of this about a decade ago, and they indicated that dislocation can induce shoulder arthropathy. They studied 55 patients, 27 of which had a prior surgical procedure. Follow-up was 45 months, and these patients improved with shoulder arthroplasty in their constant scores. Interestingly, they were unable to distinguish between operative and non-operative patients with post-dislocation pathology. Well, when these patients present, how do they complain? Probably the first issue is stiffness and loss of range of motion in addition to pain. There's often an early loss of internal rotation, and often these patients will note night pain or sleep discomfort when trying to rest on the affected shoulder. Post-activity pain is very common, and as the pathology advances, crepitus, popping, snapping, noise coming from the shoulder will be a very common complaint. Eventually, these patients will have activity restrictions and limit themselves from performing certain tasks. The physical examination is important, and I think it's very important to check the range of motion in the scapula plane. This involves having the patient supine on the examining table in order to get a true and accurate reading of the shoulder range of motion. Compare this to the unaffected side and note if crepitus is present. It's important to assess the rotator cuff and check the shoulder for stability. A good neurologic assessment is included, and these patients will often present with pain at end range of motion. Look at the biceps and the AC joints as additional sources of discomfort or pain in the patient. The differential diagnosis will include adhesive capsulitis or rotator cuff pathology, but radiographs should help determine this. In terms of imaging, glenohumeral arthritis starts with obtaining good radiographic series. I prefer a Grashy view, which is a true AP of the shoulder, an outlet x-ray, as well as an axillary view. These can be supplemented with rotational views as needed. Typically, we'll see joint space narrowing, the presence of cysts, inferior osteophytes, often referred to as a goat's beard, subchondral sclerosis, and degenerative changes such as seen in the radiograph shown. We can then move forward and determine whether this is a concentric or non-concentric arthritic condition, and we could look for glenohumeral subluxation. In patients who are going to be undergoing arthroplasty, a CT scan is invaluable. This will, this will allow us to look at the glenoid morphology as well as determine the glenoid version. MRI is rarely used, however, if there's concern about the rotator cuff, it may be helpful in assessing the rotator cuff integrity. So pre-op assessment uh, concerns the radiographic studies as shown, and these are examples of the true AP, the outlet, and the axillary view. Glenoid morphology is particularly important to obtain prior to surgery. Dr. Walsh has studied this in 1999 and published his results in the Journal of Bone and Joint Surgery as well as shoulder and elbow. We have A, B, and C with subtypes as shown, and it's very important to note both version and the congruence. The B2 glenoid in particular, or the biconcave glenoid, can be very, very difficult to work with at the time of surgery. These are better assessed with CT scanning, which is very useful for preoperative planning. The initial treatments of osteoarthritis primarily consist of education of the patient. Physical therapy can be helpful with symptom management and involves capsule stretching, joint mobilization, scap stabilization program, and modalities. We found a fluoroscopically guided intraarticular cortisone injection to be very helpful as a temporizing agent to relieve pain. Visco supplementation has not been proven to be efficacious in the treatment of shoulder arthritis. Patients are often advised to avoid the inciting activity whenever possible, and the use of anti-inflammatories, both orally and topically, can be of assistance. Surgical options are many, and these are very nicely re reviewed by Dr. Brian Cole in the Rush Journal of Orthopedics. These can consist of palliative, reparative, res restorative, reconstructive, as well as partial humeral head resurfacing, humeral head resurfacing, hemiarthroplasty, total shoulder replacement, and arthrodesis. We're now going to go through these and explore some of these options. 
In terms of palliative treatment, this might consist of glenohumeral arthroscopy with debridement, capsular release, osteoplasty or removal of the bone spurs, as well as loose body removal. This is a low risk intervention and it's minimally invasive. It really doesn't burn any bridges for any further advanced treatment and is often employed in the younger patients. It allows a full assessment of the articular surfaces to measure the degree of cartilage degeneration. It allows for visualization of the rotator cuff, the labrum, and the biceps. Additionally, this has minimal downtime for the patients with an expedited rehabilitation program being quite useful. The technique of glenohumeral arthroscopy for arthrosis involves for us the lateral decubitus position to allow for access both anteriorly and posteriorly. We found the use of an inner scaling block can be quite helpful and a good exam under anesthesia is important. The posterior portal can be a bit difficult due to the thickened fibrotic capsule, so consider an anterior entry first if this is needed. At this point, we'll debride the labrum, remove loose bodies, especially from the subscapularis recess, and trim and remove osteophytes, releasing the rotator interval and the anterior capsule as needed. We'll then place the arthroscope anterior and perform a posterior capsular release. After this, we'll go forward with a gentle post-release manipulation under anesthesia, and these patients are allowed a basically unrestricted rehabilitation program. Peter Millett has discussed comprehensive arthroscopic uh, management, and this is published on ViewMedi. His feelings are that the inferior osteophytes encroach on the axillary nerve, and he advocates for a humeral osteoplasty to remove this osteophyte and decompress the nerve. A debridement and chondroplasty are also performed, as well as releases. He's shown reasonably good results in 27 patients. However, the follow-up is quite short at 20 months, and one of these patients had already moved forward with a total shoulder replacement. So what's the purpose of capsular release? Well, in theory, it lengthens the pathologic tissue. It can decrease the joint reactive forces. It offloads the cartilage and potentially slows the degenerative process and delays the need for arthroplasty. In this regard, it is a temporizing uh, intervention and really has not been fully proven to be efficacious. However, it is a reasonable alternative in the young patient. Capsular release, again, is similar to an adhesive capsule release, begins in the rotator interval, and then move the scope posteriorly to re release the middle glenohumeral ligament and the inferior glenohumeral li ligaments. We'll then place the arthroscope anteriorly and re repeat for the posterior capsule. Again, capsule only, and try to protect the rotator cuff as shown in that depiction. The optimal results are obtained if there's limited humeral osteophyte formation in a concentric wear program uh, pattern. So the question is, does arthroscopy work for osteoarthritis? And the answer is yes, but clearly only for a time-limited procedure. Weinstein looked at this in arthroscopy over a decade ago and found about 80% good to excellent at an average of two and a half years. This was repeated with Van Thiel looking at uh, this again a decade later, again showing about 80% satisfaction at two years. Patients with a poor prognosis have grade four changes, they have bipolar changes, joint space less than two millimeters, and large inferior osteophytes. So summarizing this, this is a first line option for the evaluation and treatment with about an 80% success rate for two to five years. What are the clinical outcomes after debridement, capsulotomy, and microfracture? Well, these have been shown by various authors in various studies. And again, in summary, these have about an 80% success rate for a short term, two to five year period of time. The joint space is preserved. Smaller lesions do better, minimal osteophyte formation, and motion is the major issue. So let's move on to reparative treatment for shoulder arthritis. This involves chondroplasty, microfracture, marrow stimulation with the goal of forming fiber cartilage. 
This is working better for a focal chondral defect rather than for generalized osteoarthritis. Millette looked at this and showed 20% revision procedures within a short term time frame after the index procedure. And Brian Cole also has shown 20% second procedure within one year of institution of reparative treatment. Restorative treatment for shoulder arthritis is an attempt to establish hyaline-like cartilage. In this sense, it's known as bioorthopedic. Autologous, autologous chondrocyte implantation is an open procedure using a knee donor site and is not truly indicated for arthrosis. Habermeyer has looked at Oates procedures for this and has shown some short-term results in the Journal of Bone and Joint Surgery in a limited patient population. There's also the option of a size-matched osteochondral allograft, which is currently being explored. These can be combined with bioglenoid resurfacing in young patients. However, the literature is primarily noted to have case reports rather than series showing significant improvement with these interventions. Imhoff looked at four cases of ACI with good results at 41 months. ACI for the treatment, however, of full thickness articular defects of the shoulder has limited data. Again, Habermeyer looked at eight patients, mean age of 43, outer bridge, finding, outer bridge classification grade four, with the mean size of 150 millimeters, and it was noted that the progression of arthritis cannot be altered by this technique. In terms of reconstructive treatments, these may encompass combining prosthetic and biologic components. So this has been tried with fascia lata, allograft Achilles tendon, allograft human dermal tissue, and lateral meniscus. It's very regionally applied throughout the country with mixed long-term results. Burkhead has uh, published his results in shoulder and elbow showing a bioresurfaced glenoid with a hemiarthroplasty and human dermal allograft is often proposed as a tissue source. Lateral meniscal allograft has largely been abandoned. It is an appealing tissue as you can see by the picture to the right. It has a C-ring shape, it's load-bearing, and looks durable to match the glenoid. However, a rush study out of Chicago showed 50% failure at 2.8 years. Even further discouraging is that further arthroplasty had much less success. Perhaps the future will involve a collagen type matrix. In terms of allograft resurfacing of the glenoid in patients less than 50 years old, uh, this has been studied by J.P. Warner, looked at 19 patients. 13 of these required revision to total shoulder arthroplasty, and this procedure has been largely abandoned. Meniscal allograft, in his experience, did not hold up either radiographically or clinically. Another option might be arthroscopic osteoarticular allograft total shoulder arthroplasty. This, however, is only being performed in uh, regional centers and on very small quantities. There's preliminary results that have been encouraging. However, it's very technically challenging and no long-term results are available at this time. This may be a springboard for further methods of treatment for the young arthritic shoulder. Glenoid opening wedge osteotomy has also been discussed. Originally, this was proposed for fixed subluxation with instability with the goal of recentering the humeral head. However, this has now been largely abandoned. So a sobering thought that we've had in our quest to find the solutions to the answer of articular cartilage degeneration, it's been noted that biologic repair continues to remain elusive and it's difficult to offer reproducible results for our patients. However, shoulder arthroplasty has evolved to become highly consistent and much more anatomic. So what about shoulder arthroplasty? We're now on our fourth generation so-called components. We have multiple options including caps, resurfacing, hemiarthroplasty, and total shoulder arthroplasty. It's been projected that total shoulders are going to rise 192% from 2007 to 2015. What's more is the outcomes are predictable. Carter looked at a meta-analysis which was published in the Journal of Bone and Joint Surgery 
and showed significant increases in three shoulder scores, pain and function, and overall physical well-being. So the first option might be considered the CAP, also known as hemicap or arthrosurface. And this was developed first for use in focal chondral defects as opposed to full head humeral arthrosis. Avascular necrosis has also been shown to have some good results with this uh, down in Miami. There are some limitations in head size and options, although this has been increased. This can leave a fairly large humeral head defect secondary to the large insertion threads that are present on the device, but short-term follow-up, again, has shown very reasonable results uh, with this intervention. Humeral head resurfacing allows for full humeral head coverage for arthritis. It preserves the humeral head bone stock for possible future procedures, such as total shoulder arthroplasty. It maintains a normal humerus inclination inversion, so its attractive features such as this make this an inviting implant to use. It can be used in isolation or with a biologic glenoid resurfacing or ream and run. There are even centers that are using this with a full polyethylene glenoid as a so-called total shoulder. Ellen Becker showed uh, humeral head resurfacing in patients under 55 years old, again with short-term follow-up, two years, had 35 out of 36 satisfied. So what are the indications for a resurfacing? Primarily, this is arthritis with a concentric glenohumeral joint. B2 glenoids would probably be an exclusion to this. It requires good proximal humeral bone stock, and it's preferred in males. It can be used selectively in chondrolysis or glenoid dysplasia. However, the results are not as good as a total shoulder replacement. However, this theoretically preserves bone stock for an anticipated procedure down the line. It is not a panacea, and pain relief is not as reliable as a total shoulder replacement as been demonstrated by Dr. Sperling out of the Mayo Clinic. In terms of resurfacing issues and outcomes, there is the possibility of progression in glenoid erosion. At difficult, it's difficult at times to fully debride the glenoid due to the humeral head maintaining its position and limiting access. It's still not really known what the best treatment of the glenoid is, and in many cases of this concentric type of arthritis, we'll simply leave that alone. Copeland has shown two to five year uh, follow-up without revision using his resurfacing technique, and Pritchett demonstrated a three-year follow-up of 61 patients with very good results. In terms of the technique of sur uh, the surgical technique of resurfacing, much like a total shoulder replacement, beach chair position with a deltopectoral approach, we tend to um, utilize a subscapularis peel-off technique. A tenotomy may also be utilized. We'll dislocate the humerus, and it's still quite important to remove all the surrounding humeral osteophytes, perform capsular releases, and excise tissue as needed. We'll typically tenodice the long head of the biceps, either to the pectoralis or to the short head of the biceps, and hopefully in the future, we may one day be able to perform this through the rotator interval without a subscapularis takedown. Sizing the head is critical, and it's important to remove all humeral osteophytes. It's important to measure the head in both planes. If you're between sizes, choose the smaller size. It's important not to overstuff the joint with this. In terms of the reaming, the appropriate size reamer is utilized, and this is performed on power. Typically, this is engaged over an alignment pin and will ream until the borders of the reamer are in contact with the humeral neck. We'll then choose the appropriate size punch and insert this over the alignment pin. We'll have two fins pointing medially and then impact this down to the collar. The stem punch is smaller in length and width than the final implant, and it provides additional press fit of the final implant. In hard bones, sequential punching can be utilized to help assist in the placement of the implant. The final implant is uh, performed after removing the trial head. We'll uh, place the final component by hand to properly align this and then impact this into position. We'll reduce the humerus and confirm proper soft tissue balance and proper subscapularis repair is accomplished typically with suture anchors for these resurfacings. 
The rehabilitation involves a three-phased approach with the first three weeks in a sling and obtaining external rotation only to neutral range of motion through safe parameters. We'll then increase the range of motion and begin a strengthening program after nine weeks. This will allow progressive return to work and selective sports. Here's a case example. This is a 44-year-old male. He's a power lifter and a professional personal trainer. He has severe pain with activities of daily living and loss of range of motion. He's had two prior shoulder arthroscopies and somewhat unwilling to modify his activity profile. He stands six feet tall, 290 pounds, and in the past he has bench pressed as much as 680 pounds. His x-rays are shown, which demonstrate a large inferior humeral osteophyte with loss of joint space. He uh, underwent a shoulder resurfacing and had his pain relieved postoperatively, although he still has some very mild functional restrictions. Intraoperatively, one can see the large humeral spur, or the goat's beard, as noted both on the left and right pictures. And these are his postoperative humeral resurfacing x-rays. This is another example of a 52-year-old technician who had chondrolysis of the humeral head. Again, he had failed two shoulder arthroscopies and was unable to work. He had stiffness with unrelenting pain. He had a requirement of 50 to 60 pounds lifting. He had an intact rotator cuff with a concentric glenohumeral arthrosis, and these are his postoperative radiographs. His range of motion is shown here, demonstrating excellent forward elevation and internal rotation. What are some of the complications with humeral head resurfacing? These are somewhat similar to total shoulder arthroplasty. However, there's less instability. There's no polyethylene wear, but we're uncertain as to how the glenoid is going to behave under these strains and stresses with this implant. The studies vary widely in the longevity of the implant, but revision to a total shoulder arthroplasty is theoretically easier. However, I should still note that this is quite a challenge due to the subscapularis and possible deficiencies in proximal humerus bone. J.P. Warner uh, demonstrated his results and showed a 25% uh, failure, and he urged the use of this with caution, especially with prior surgery. Hemiarthroplasty consists of resection of the proximal humerus at the anatomic neck with replacement using a stemmed implant. It can be useful with less dense bone or when better access to the glenoid is needed. Some fractures uh, can also be utilized and treated with a hemiarthroplasty. There's multiple series available, predominantly from Drs. Matson and Rockwood, and Gartsman has shown a 12% revision rate short-term for pain with hemiarthroplasty. Dr. Sperling out of Mayo Clinic showed a much higher survival rate of total shoulder replacement versus a hemiarthroplasty, even in patients under 50 years old. He had a revision rate of 19% with humeral head replacement versus 11% uh, with total shoulder replacement, and this was a 17-year follow-up, good long-term follow-up at the Mayo Clinic. Inevitably, there's always a discussion concerning humeral head replacement versus total shoulder arthroplasty, and these studies are all available, and they all show in the long run that total shoulder replacement does do better than a humeral head replacement in the long term. But what about the younger patient? What about hemiarthroplasty with a biologic resurfacing? This is often mentioned, however, the results are quite mixed. Dr. Burkhead out in Texas demonstrated a series of 34 patients showing 15% unsatisfactory results. Predominantly, this was from glenoid erosion. Dr. Warner showed 10 out of 13 patients utilizing this technique requiring revision. There are multiple series demonstrating a high failure rate using this technique. Humeral head replacement with ream and rum. This is advocated out on the West Coast with Dr. Matson. 35 consecutive patients match controls having a total shoulder arthroplasty, and it was felt that the ream and run procedure can offer similar functional recovery with total shoulder replacement, although the time to recovery may be longer. Some of the issues for hemiarthroplasty, glenoid erosion, capsular shift, prior surgery, rotator cuff disease, all are negative predictors for a hemiarthroplasty. 
Dr. Saltzman showed a 14% revision at two years. Conversion to a total shoulder replacement, these results are inferior compared to a primary total shoulder replacement being utilized as the index procedure. What about glenoid pain after humeral head replacement? What about revision to total shoulder arthroplasty? And this has been studied by Dr. Carroll, looked at 16 patients with a mean of five plus years follow-up, 47% unsatisfactory, with a mean shoulder and elbow score of 73.6. There was posterior glenoid erosion in 64% of patients, and again, the results are inferior to those of a total shoulder replacement. The new generation of modular humeral head replacements may make revision to a total shoulder a bit easier with the newer techniques and the newer implants. Here's a case example of a heavy arthroplasty. This is a 52-year-old female, no prior history of shoulder pain. She fell in her garden and was diagnosed with a proximal humerus fracture as seen in these x-rays. However, she was unable to move or rotate her arm for three months despite physical therapy and healing of her fracture, and she presented with a stiff, painful shoulder. Further radiographs obtained in our office showed she had a posterior dislocation at about three and a half months out. Her options may consist of an open reduction with a subscap advancement, a hemiarthroplasty or resurfacing, an osteochondral graft, a cap or a total shoulder replacement, and we opted for a hemiarthroplasty for this patient. And here you can see her humeral head at the time of surgery. These are post-operative um, pictures, and she's done quite well with this um, intervention. As a final step, let's talk about total shoulder arthroplasty because this is still the best and most reproducible result. I think the newer designs allow for more anatomic restoration, and while the glenoid has been the weak link in survival, the current glenoid that's favored is still high molecular weight polyethylene without a metal back, and we do feel that the current generation of glenoids has improved substantially. There may be a slight trend toward favorable peg fixation over a keel. Total shoulder arthroplasty in younger patients is always an option for treatment, and the patient needs to respect the implant and alter their activity profile in order to enable longevity of the implant. As we say, just because you can do a particular task doesn't mean that you should be doing it, and currently our 20-year survival estimation is 85% at 20 years, and this is from Dr. Sperling at Mayo Clinic. However, this is all ages, not just young patients. Complications do exist. We're all aware of infection. P. acnes is of particular concern because young males are at the highest risk. Instability, loosening, fracture, nerve injury, pain, stiffness, and fibrosis. Rotator cuff tears are probably a longer-term concern, and at 15 years, it's been shown that over half of patients have rotator cuff tears after total shoulder arthroplasty, and glenoid wear is a concern with younger patients. The question is, will the better designs and the newer generation of polyethylene reduce this problem? So what's the technique? Well, we've already demonstrated uh, the basic technique with resurfacing, beach chair position, interscaling block, deltopectoral approach, taking down the subscapularis as per the surgeon's choice with either a subscapularis tenotomy, peel-off, or a lesser tuberosity osteotomy, tenodesing the long head of the biceps, performing a humeral osteotomy with osteophyte excision, and obtaining good glenoid exposure with a 360-degree capsule labral release. In terms of implant issues, right now we're favoring an all-poly glenoid central peg with minimal cement, and right now this has been shown to have no loosening in 30 out of 34 patients at 28 months on a CT scan study performed by Dr. Carl Basmania. The evolution of short stem and stemless humeral components is ongoing, and we are currently favoring a short stem implant for most of our younger active patients. Dr. Walsh looked at the mid- and long-term outcomes of total shoulder arthroplasty in patients under 55 years old, and this was presented at the AAOS in 2013. He looked at 52 patients and noted the initial scores increased dramatically. However, there were 34% complications with glenoid loosening 
in 12, which was 24% of his series. 21 of these patients required revision surgeries. There was a 98% survival at five years. However, this dipped down to a 62.5% uh, survival at 10 years. His thoughts were that the humerus may decide the outcome, and it was important not to oversize the humeral component, and he felt that improvement was only marginal after glenoid revision. Total shoulder replacement outcomes, however, are overall very satisfying for patients of all ages. Again, the meta-analysis alluded to earlier from Dr. Carter showed at 3.7 years significant improvement. There was significant improvement in the overall physical well-being with a moderate to large effect size. This is our total shoulder rehabilitation program, which is available online. In terms of our reverse total shoulder, this was developed uh, by Gramont in France to, in 1985. And basically, this reverses the standard total shoulder replacement that we just went through. It lateralizes the humerus so deltoid muscle can power the shoulder and is used predominantly for deficient rotator cuffs fractures, and revisions. What does the future hold? Well, we're hopeful that collagen matrices, cartilage gels, and patches may further improve, that there will be better biologic options to offer these young patients. There'll be a large increase, we know already, in shoulder arthroplasty and total shoulder replacement, and that there'll be continued implant improvement and options. Better glenoids with options to improve version of the glenoid are already being uh, reviewed and researched by Dr. Joe Iannotti. Hopefully, there'll be more minimally invasive approaches with preservation of tendon units, and this is also ongoing research that's been initially presented with some limited data. We're using CT scans to predict who resurfacing might help more accurately, and we're looking for that next reverse shoulder arthroplasty breakthrough. So in summary, some recommendations. There's really no panacea for these young patients. For early disease, an arthroscopic debridement with capsulotomies can be helpful. For more advanced disease in young patients with a centered head, consider a humeral head resurfacing or a replacement without the use of a graft. If you're using a humeral head replacement, there should be concentric wear, preferably with minimal glenoid changes. Advanced imaging can certainly assist in assessing this. Humeral head replacement and total shoulder replacement have comparable early results, but humeral head replacement results are not sustained, and they carry the increased risk of glenoid erosion necessitating revision. After age 45, our current recommendation is to lean toward a total shoulder arthroplasty. These patients require a high degree of individualization, and we strive to match the patient, the age, the activity and the demand with the technique. Consider the recovery times. At this point in time, considering all things equal, a well done total shoulder replacement can reliably give the best results, but we need to improve longer term outcomes in this younger group of patients. Thank you very much.